Welcome to the Peter King Podcast presented by Salesforce. I'm joining you from California this week. I'm the opposite of Miles. Miles is usually in Pacific time. I'm in Eastern time. He's in Eastern time in Cleveland. I'm in Pacific time in California where we had a King family Christmas with the three grandchildren and uh, a couple of families, one from Seattle, one from the Bay Area. So we've had a good a good time. And um, for some of you, you might have followed my uh, family adventures over the years, first in Monday Morning Quarterback, then in Football Morning in America. So we have a four-year-old granddaughter, Hazel, uh, who lives here in California, and who uh, they have a new dog. And the dog's name is, a, he's a very, she's a very skittish something mix. I don't know. She's brown. I just call her brown dog, but her name is Jersey. And uh, so Jersey is scared to death of men. So I've been in this house now for like five days. And just yesterday I got to pet her. Um, But anyway, I asked Hazel at one point, I said, Hazel, do you have any advice for me on how to get Jersey to like me? And she thought for a minute, she said, you've got to give her her space. And so I said, there's a good lesson in that. And Miles Simmons, I've given you about 2,000 miles worth of space today. How are you? I'm doing great. I uh, I don't have any dog stories like that. No dogs are around here in the Simmons household for me to learn how to pet. But that's a fantastic story. And I think that there is a good lesson in that. You do sometimes got to give people their space in order to make them feel comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I am in the... Uh, the little spare work office in the backyard of my uh, of my daughter's home here in California. So the lighting is not pristine. And for you people on YouTube, uh, my apologies. It's not particularly beautiful this morning, but anyway, or this week. So Miles, we've got a lot to get to. We're going to be joined later in the podcast by Michael Zagaris, who's a, uh, I mean, he's been taking pictures of NFL people and NFL games since I was six years old. And seeing that I'm now uh, 65, uh, he's got some good s- stories to tell. So we're going to get you, 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 let's say you're delayed in a in an airport somewhere or you're having travel troubles, whatever, and you're really ticked off. You got to listen to Michael Zagaris. He's funny. He's engaging. And he's got stories from Vince Lombardi to Joe Montana to Kyle Shanahan. So you're really going to like this conversation I had with him. Miles, we got a lot to get to. All right. Number one, what should Denver do now that they fired Paul, uh, Paul Hackett, Nathaniel Hackett? Number two, what should Indianapolis do? This team looks awful. And this little bolt of energy they were supposed to get from Jeff Saturday, never mind. Uh, the playoff races stink, by the way, particularly in the AFC. I mean, other than the AFC South, which will be a winner take all in week 18, Tennessee at Jacksonville. I mean, come on. There, there's really nothing going on. Uh, and I never thought after we watched New England the last two weeks that it would be a crucial game for the New England Patriots. It's incredible that they've still got a good shot to make it. But anyway, so we got that. Um, And I shouldn't say good shot. I mean, they got to beat Miami and Buffalo. That's a little bit tough. Um, So we've also got the Chargers getting hot at the right time, even though they're not playing, I would say, great. Miles is going to analyze the Monday nighter. And, you know, Seattle might not feel lucky after falling out of the pennant race in the NFC, all but falling out. But I think I'm going to tell you why I think the Seahawks are going to be grinning ear to ear come April. Um, Cincinnati and San Francisco, both on seven game winning streaks. I mean, it's absolutely crazy to think because we've been thinking all year about, okay, who's it going to be, Buffalo or Kansas City? What about the Bengals? Yep. The Bengals could spoil it for everybody. A very tenuous time for Tua with the head trauma and back in the concussion protocol in Miami. We will discuss that. Um, We're going to talk about the meaning of the Dallas Cowboys win 
and I, how I do not denigrate it because Jalen Hurts wasn't playing. Uh, I had a conversation with Dak Prescott about this, this game, this win over Philadelphia. And then finally, I sense a little bit of concern in Baltimore. Lamar might not be close to returning. So we need to discuss that and then talk about, I mean, if Lamar doesn't play, Baltimore's offense is totally from hunger. So we're going to talk about all that. And Miles has a real interesting take, I think, on Baker Mayfield and what should Baker Mayfield do in 2023. And I 1,043% agree with Miles Simmons. So we're going to get to all that. Miles, we're going to start off by talking about the firing of Nathaniel Hackett. Honestly, it was it was it was a mercy firing. I don't want to over dramatize it by calling it euthanasia, but this was over. The yeah. team is out of control. They're arguing on the sidelines. You got Randy Gregory punching people after the game. It's just look, everybody in the business likes Nathaniel Hackett, thinks he's a smart guy. I called him a savant in the preseason. And in many ways, I think he is an offensive savant. But it takes a lot more than being a really smart guy to be a great head coach in the NFL. And and my two quick thoughts, and I really want to get to yours, is that I saw a list yesterday of the of the odds for the people to succeed. Uh, Nathaniel Hackett. And number one on the list was Sean Payton. I, I just want to ask respectfully, whoever makes such odds, are you out of your freaking mind? Do you honestly think that Sean Payton, who offensively will be the hottest guy on the market, would want to go to the dumpster fire that is the Denver Broncos? The guy who's going to take the Denver Broncos job will be a guy who is convinced that he can fix Russell Wilson. And I'm not sure that he can be fixed, but he might be able to be fixed. This year was shocking, obviously, in so many ways. But the other thing I wanted to say was, Rich Gannon was on Sirius NFL radio yesterday. I was out running a couple of errands and I listened to it. And he had this long screed and he's absolutely right. You know, when I was in Denver in training camp, Russell Wilson's, you know, uh, had been given his own cubicle slash office in the facility. And he met there sometimes with Nathaniel Hackett. And and then, you know, the other thing is he was doing workouts with his team in training camp alone, just him and the players at 7 a.m. before training camp practice started. It was just a walkthrough to go over the script for that day and what they were going to install. And I had after I wrote that, I had a bunch of coaches, uh, not only later on my training camp tour, but people who talked to me in August say, essentially, I wouldn't allow that. I wouldn't let a quarterback have an, have his off, have an office in the facility. And I certainly wouldn't let him have a practice alone with the players to talk about the installation of the plays. And look, a lot of this right now seems horrible because Russell Wilson, quite frankly, has been horrible. But Rich Gannon on Sirius was saying, listen, that guy's got to be a member of the team. He can't be a special case. So I think whoever the new coach is, you got to get a little bit of egalitarianism back in the facility and back with this team. Give me your thoughts, Miles, on on what Denver should do. Well, it, it's tough because I, I think, Peter, that this is one of the least desirable head coaching jobs that has come up in years. And, you know, there are only 32 of them. So when you're saying it's the least desirable, I mean, that's not necessarily saying all that much. Somebody's going to want to take that job. I mean, from just the fact that it is an NFL head coach, yeah, somebody wants it. But you have Russell Wilson who is essentially a, a two-ton anvil basically dragging down the organization. Right? It's not just his play, it's the contract. And so you can't really just get out of that 
things scot-free like you would be able to in many other situations. I mean, even I, I think about, of course, the, the Rams, because I have so much experience with them, but with Jared Goff, right? And that contract was seemed like it was not good, but the Rams still found a way to get out of that contract, get Matthew Stafford, and then they won the Super Bowl. It's really, 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 really cost prohibitive for the Denver Broncos to get rid of Russell Wilson. And so I think that whole aspect of it, and if you look at his play and you don't think that you can fix Russell Wilson, then you're going to say, man, if I've got options, I don't want that job. And I think that's why Sean Payton being considered the top candidate for that job, he's going to have options. And if I'm him, I don't want anything to do with that because I know that if I'm in a different situation, it might be better for me. So I, it was just, it felt inevitable with Nathaniel Hackett. I mean, we saw at week one that he just was not prepared to do the in-game management situations, right? When a 64-yard yeah. field goal is your plan A and you're not at altitude, it's one of those moments where you're like, dude, what in the world are you doing? What are you thinking? Why is it that you have this quarterback and you don't think fourth and six or fourth and five with him throwing the football is a better option than a 64 yard field goal. None of that made any sense. And then it just kept snowballing and snowballing afterwards. So as you said, Peter, it's kind of a mercy firing, but I mean, I don't see how this is a very good job for somebody going forward, unless yeah. you are totally convinced that you can fix Russell Wilson. And, you know, look, Miles, uh, the other part of this that we talk about, and I wrote this in my column this week, FYI, if you want to fire Russell Wilson after this year, it's a $107 million cap hit in yeah. the offseason. So you're right. Somebody's going to have to try to make do with uh, with this quarterback for at least one more year. And look, probably two, but... Everybody, everybody says like it's automatic, okay, that, oh, you can't do anything with Russell Wilson until, you know, 2026 or whatever, whatever people are saying. Like it'll be uh, if you cut him after 2025, which means you got him for three more years, it's only a $31 million cap hit. But, but hang on a minute, hang on a minute. I'm just going to make this point, and it's a crazy, crazy point. If I'm Denver and next year is as bad as this year was, I and I mean, this sounds crazy, but I would rather take the $85 million cap hit to get rid of Russell Wilson in March of 2024 than keep him on my roster and basically try to win without him. What, what George Payton and the new coach, what they're going to have to do is go find Mike White is go find a quarterback yeah. who can be competitive. He might not be your future, but look, here's the thing about the Denver Broncos. All right. They have a pick in the twenties this year for Miami. I forget 25, 23, something like that. It, 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 or whatever it's going to be. Sure. You know, or, and it's not from Miami. It's from the Bradley Chubb trade from Miami, but it's actually San Francisco's uh, pick. Uh, that Miami owned in the 2023 draft. But be that as it may, you're not going to take a quarterback this year, okay? But if you're a lousy team next year, then you're going to take a quarterback in April of 2024. And again, I don't mean to be, uh, you know, to be putting the cart before 10 miles before the horse, but let's just think about it. If you take a rookie quarterback uh, in 20. 24 and you get him ready to play and have a veteran have a a mike white type okay then you can have a very low cost uh quarterback for yeah. the next two or three years and that will allow you to ameliorate a ridiculously bad stupid awful salary cap hit and yes. everybody out there is now saying oh well, you can't take an 85 million dollar cap hit well let me ask you a question would you rather let Russell Wilson play or or would you rather just let him be your third string quarterback who doesn't uh who doesn't dress anymore and who is just around the facility and who is a reminder every day of this horrible thing 
you listen, if he's awful next year, you have to cut the cord. I don't care. I, I understand it's 85 million, but with the new TV contracts and the fact that, you know, if the cap is going to be pick a number, 260 million in 2024, and I don't know what it'll be, 250 to 260 million. I, I remember a few years ago, a general manager I trust when I was saying, man, your quarterback is taking up so much of the cap. And at the time, the cap was something like 180. And he said to me, he goes, you know, if you can't put a team together with $140 million, you're a pretty bad general manager. And I kind of feel the same way. If you can't put a team together, even in 2024, yeah. with $170 million in cap money, knowing that you're getting rid of the anvil, I don't think you're very much of a general manager. But anyway, we'll see what happens. I just am not a big fan of people who say, well, you can't cut them till 2026. Yeah, you can. You can. So anyway, um, Miles, on the Monday, on the subject of the Monday night game. So I want to know what you think about the Indianapolis Colts who now have that one, what appears to be uh, a, a totally bizarre, weird, uh, almost significantly less impressive win uh, in their opener with Jeff Saturday against Vegas. And they've had five losses since. And in the last two weeks at Minnesota and against the Chargers on Monday night, They've been outscored 9,000 to nothing in the last six quarters. So so I, I want to know, what do you do right now if you're Jimmy Ursay? Do you keep Jeff Saturday? Do you keep Chris Ballard? What exactly do you do? What's your recipe to try to fix this team now? I'm waiting until the college football playoff is over and maybe it's after, you know, New Year's Eve when Michigan gets booted or maybe it's, you know, the next Monday night after they lose to Georgia. But I'm given all I can to go get Jim Harbaugh and say, hey, man, whatever you want to come in here and transform this franchise, that's what we're going to do. And if you want to get rid of Chris Ballard, Fine, but that's what I would do because I mean, it's obvious that Jim Irsay cares about the Colts and the Colts as an institution. And what are the Colts? And what's better than having somebody who is in your ring of honor come back to your sideline and somebody you know can be a really good NFL head coach because he's done it, right? Jim, uh, Jim Harbaugh has been good as a coach at pretty much every level. And everywhere he's been, he's been successful, including at Michigan, especially now. So that's what I would do. I mean, I get Jeff Saturday out of there, you know, God love him. And I think Jeff Saturday's doing the best that he can, but look, there's only so much that you can do when you were a television analyst and your highest level of coaching was in high school. And then you come in there and yeah, you have all this NFL experience, but man, this obviously has not worked. And I think part of the problem, too, is the talent that is assembled on the roster. And I know Jim Mercy has said that Chris Ballard will be back, you know, in 2023. And that's fine. But if that's something that's going to prohibit you from going and getting Jim Harbaugh, then to me, you got to show him the door, too. And I have a lot of respect for Chris Ballard. I think that he's done a lot of good things in Indianapolis. But clearly right now, this roster does not work. It is a dearth of talent, especially on offense. The offensive line is very high priced. It's not playing like it, right? You know, you've got a bunch of weapons. Sometimes they show up, sometimes they don't. You know, the quarterback position is obviously a mess, and it's been a mess since Andrew Luck retired. To, and to an extent, I understand that. But yeah, I, I think they've got to give a full court press to Jim Harbaugh and tell him, okay, man, come in and let's transform this franchise and let's make us a winner in the AFC South again. I think the really depressing thing, if I'm Jim Ursay, uh, when I'm looking at this roster, is we decided to exercise the Hail Mary clause on our roster and put in Nick Foles mm -hmm. uh, to quarterback this game. And look, quite honestly, in my opinion, I would bet a $1,000 that Frank Reich would rather have played Nick Foles than Sam Ellinger um, 
you know, before he got fired. Absolutely. And that's my guess. But, you know, Foles hasn't played in a long time. He was awful on Monday night. And the other thing is for everybody said, oh, my God, he's terrible and blah, 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 blah. He got sacked seven times. He got significantly pressured nine other times. <laughs> and just think about this. I mean, he only had 29 pass drops. So on more than half of his pass drops, he was either sacked or significantly pressured. It's going to be hard for a guy to have any success. And I, so uh, with that sort of pressure. And Miles, you are a hundred percent correct when you say that. Look, I think the big indictment on um, the personnel side of this team is that Michael Pittman is nowhere near a number one receiver. That's number one. Number two, uh, they have not used uh, Alec Pierce nearly enough. Um, he should be who you design your offense to, to go around Paris Campbell. These other guys who've been drafted are not, none of them are the answer. They're all bit pieces in, in a, in a time of great receivers in college football, the Indianapolis Colts do not have one mm -hmm. and they've tried. And my, um, I've got a big problem with how Pierce is used. He should be getting a lot more. I think he had four targets Monday night, but he just simply hasn't been used enough this year. And 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 then you look at the offensive line. That was supposed to be the shining jewel of this franchise. And it stinks. It mm -hmm. stinks. So I think I think Jim Ursay, I mean, his problem is look, Jim Ursay is an interesting character, obviously. He's got a lot of money that he puts into things like. Um, collectibles and you know he's got so many things he's got a Ringo Starr drum set uh, he's got all this stuff from Muhammad Ali a championship belt he, and he goes around the country and he doesn't charge people to come and see it and he brings great musicians together to do a concert and all that so I get it he has fun in his life but his number one business right now is tanking and as much as I personally like Chris Ballard, I think that if there is a way to get Harbaugh, you remember, Miles, when Jim Harbaugh was, was being wooed the last time uh, by more than one team, uh, he wanted to bring uh, Mike Lombardi, a longtime veteran front office guy. He wanted to bring Mike Lombardi with him, who most recently was, uh, you know, was with Bill Belichick. But and and so, look, I don't know if uh, I, I don't know what Jim Harbaugh's asking price will be. But the, the only reason I bring up Ursay and, and all that is that he doesn't have the wealth of the Denver Broncos or the Dallas Cowboys. So he's going to have to think pretty hard about paying off not only Frank Reich, but Chris Ballard, both of whom have contracts through 2027. So that is going to be a decision that he will have to make. So we'll see what happens. Um, I wanted to focus a little bit on uh, the playoff races. Originally, I was going to lead the podcast with saying, oh my God, playoff. I, I, it's The playoff races are so uninteresting right now. And they are <laughs> uninteresting. But I didn't want to be Debbie Downer, really. Let's. So I said, ah, we'll save it to number three. So, yes, the playoff races stink. And I want to talk about one aspect of why they stink, okay? And that is that the league this year has become exceedingly top-heavy. Yes. Okay? And so in the AFC, Buffalo 12-3, and three, Kansas City 12-3, and three, Cincinnati 11-4. and four. And then, okay, probably, I mean, of course, Baltimore has clinched a playoff spot. Uh, so so they're going to make it, and the Chargers have nine wins. But, but really, I mean, who's afraid of anybody else in the AFC right now? The only team that you might say, you know, they could really be trouble is Jacksonville, quite honestly. I don't fear New England at all. I have no idea who Miami is right now. Uh, because I don't know who's going to play quarterback for them. So, 
Miles, let's talk about the AFC because right now it is almost certainly going to be either Buffalo or Kansas City as the number one seed. Cincinnati or one Buffalo, Kansas City, and Cincinnati will be the top three seeds. Yes. Okay. And then either Jacksonville or Tennessee is going to be the fourth seed. It's totally bizarre to know all that stuff before you get to the last two weeks of the regular season. It's crazy. Uh, And as of now, Baltimore and the Chargers have both clinched. And for the last playoff spot, it's going to be, you know, a mishmash of Miami, New England, with a slight possibility of the Jets, Tennessee, or Pittsburgh. And again, look, I mean, usually the seven seed in a playoffs in the playoffs is not that big a deal. But this year, there's going to be some really interesting stories. Can the Steelers climb their way into the last seed in the AFC, uh, defying almost every bit of logic? I don't think so, but we'll see. Uh, Can the Jets win out uh, with Mike White? Can New England recover after really hitting rock bottom? And can Miami win with an uncertain quarterback situation? Every one of those teams, every one of those candidate teams is flawed. I didn't even mention Tennessee, but they've lost four in a row and they look awful right now. So any or five in a row, excuse me. So Miles, tell me about the AFC right now. What do you think? And what do you think happens? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head, Peter, when you say that it's top heavy, because it really is. And I, you know, I just, I find it hard to believe that it won't be one of Buffalo, Kansas City, or Cincinnati that represents the AFC in the Super Bowl. But we've got a long way to go until we figure out exactly how those three teams are going to duke it out and then, uh, and then get there. So it's interesting to me that Buffalo and Cincinnati play on Monday night football. I mean, that should be a beautiful heavyweight drag yeah. out slug fest, but then behind them. Yeah. You got to figure out, okay, is, is Tennessee or Jacksonville going to come out of the AFC South? I mean, I think it should be Jacksonville. Jacksonville is playing like the team. I thought that they were going to be when they were two and one and back in September, I'm like, yeah, Jacksonville is going to roll to the AFC South. And then they made me look like an idiot. And now they're making me look smart again. So keep it up Jacksonville, but thing behind (laughs) them, like, you know, you got all these wild card teams and I don't really believe that new England has the offensive firepower or prowess or whatever you want to call it to really win out and get to the postseason, Mike white being back is going to be huge for the jets because it just means that they're going to have a quarterback that they believe in. And frankly, the way that they were playing last Thursday night, you could just tell nobody believed in Zach Wilson, including himself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I mean, you look at the other teams, Miami, I, I would think that Miami should be able to make it to the postseason, but given the quarterback uncertainty and frankly, the way that Tunga Bailoa was playing, even when he was healthy in the last you know month or so, you just don't really know. So there, yeah, there's intriguing stuff on the back end, but to me, whoever gets that seven seed is going to go to Buffalo or Cincinnati or Kansas city and essentially be a sacrificial lamb, which I'm kind of fine with that. But it, it does at least give us some intriguing things to talk about, you know, in the last couple of weeks, even if we kind of figure and we know what the result's going to be once we get to mid-January. So let's let's scrape away Buffalo and Cincinnati meeting Monday night uh, in Cincinnati and just say that the most meaningful game in the AFC other than that this week is Miami at New England. Miami losers of four in a row. New England losers of four of the last five. And, you know, that's what it's come to for the seventh seed in the AFC, that one of those, two, the winner of that game, look, if Miami wins, uh, they're all but in. But I think one of the things that you look at right now, and, and let's transition to the NFC, because I talked about how top heavy it was. So let's look at the NFC, Philadelphia 13 and two ahead of the NFC East, Minnesota 12 and three dominating the uh, NFC North and San Francisco 11 and four dominating the NFC West. So the only real race there is, even though technically there's a race in the NFC East, the Eagles would have to lose 
both games at home remaining. And Dallas would have to win both games on the road remaining, starting with a short week Thursday night game at Tennessee playing for its season. And I don't know who's going to win that game. I think probably Dallas, but be that as it may, I, I don't know how Philadelphia doesn't win. But but anyway, so the the North is done. It's been done for a while. The West is done. It's been done for a while. That leaves the NFC South. And I just want to say one thing about the NFC South right now that, and this really comes from a conversation I had with Steve Wilkes, the coach of the Panthers the other day. And he basically has told Ben McAdoo, the offensive coordinator, hey, listen, let's play to our strengths. We got a good offensive line. Let's forget trying to do too much in the passing game. Let's just do enough and let us ground and pound people. As Steve Wilkes said, it's we are not sexy. And so if you look at Carolina, you know, Carolina is six and nine behind Tampa by one game, seven, Tampa seven and eight. And they play in Tampa on Sunday. And I like Carolina, Miles. I don't know how many rabbits Tom Brady can pull out of his hat uh, anymore. Uh, but Tampa is just not a good football team. They're a good, desperate football team, but they're not a good football team. So I don't know. Say handicap the NFC South for me in the last two weeks with New Orleans, uh, a game behind Tampa at Philadelphia, then Carolina at home. Carolina, two road games, one game behind Tampa at Tampa at New Orleans. And then uh, Tampa Bay at home with Carolina. And then they're at Atlanta in week 18. Who do you like and why? Well, I, I agree with you. I, I tend to like the Panthers. And I, I think that they're just playing the best out of any of those teams. And I think that they have the most successful recipe at any of those teams. I mean, they, they're going to be missing J.C. Horn, you know, who's got the wrist yeah. injury. And that's a big deal for them. But also, I mean, the way that they play, is conducive, I think, to beating the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And I don't think that they're going to get into a situation where they let Tom Brady hang around and hang around and hang around. And then all of a sudden they get into desperation mode and bing, bang, boom, Tom Brady does Tom Brady things and the Buccaneers win. And that's the only way that the Buccaneers have been able to win games over the last couple of months. It's been ridiculous. And it's just the fact that Tom Brady has that kind of experience, right? And he gets comfortable in those kind of high leverage, high pressure situations. But the Buccaneers have not been a good football team all season long. I mean, if they were in any other division, we would have declared them dead ages ago. If they had yeah. any other quarterback, you know, who was playing like Tom Brady and didn't have the two minute, you know, let's get it done. Let's get desperation um, into desperation mode experience. Then they also would have been dead. But I mean, the Cardinals should have won that game on Christmas night. They just decided yeah. to do a dumb thing and pitch the ball instead of just run the ball up the middle on third and one. I don't really understand what you're doing, Cliff Kingsbury, but I haven't understood what they've been doing in Arizona for over a year now. So it's just one of those situations where I believe that the Panthers should win that division because they're playing the best. They're on that upward trajectory. They have a head coach who understands not just the buttons to push on his team and how to motivate them, but really what the right strategy is to come in and beat somebody. I, I thought that was a very impressive win that they had over Detroit because Detroit became our yeah. darlings, right? Yeah. And Detroit's playing as well as anybody in the national football league. And they go down there to Charlotte and they get steamrolled by the Panthers. So that says a lot to me about where Carolina is and how they can play. And frankly, I think they would definitely be a more interesting matchup with the Cowboys in that first round of the postseason, even though Tom Brady, I know is seven and zero against that team. I don't, I don't want to see it. I've, I've had enough. Uh, yeah. I just, I would love to see the Panthers in the postseason. I totally agree. I think it'd be fun, a fun thing to see. Um, Miles, I want to get to our guest now. It's Michael Zagaris, um, who is the author of, uh, I, I don't mean, I don't want to diminish this book at all because as I'm going to explain, but it's a coffee table book. It weighs about seven pounds. It is, it's, it's so interesting. Michael Zagaris is a Bay area photographer 
and he has come out with a book and it's called field of play uh my 60 years of nfl photography and the reason why this book is so good is that it takes you into the real world of pro football i mean you are going to see photographs in this book of steve young getting shot up with a pain killing injection uh you're also going to see bill romanowski uh you know getting uh getting a painkiller and it there's just so many interesting things in this book that describe the real world of pro football and i loved it we had a very good conversation so i want to bring you my uh, discussion on his new book and on his life taking pictures in the national football league michael zagaris Happy to be back on the podcast now, joined by Michael Zagaris, who basically uh, has photographed everything in the history of the NFL, except like going back to 1920 with the Canton Bulldogs. But um, one of the reasons why I wanted to have Michael on the podcast, he's one of the most interesting characters I've ever met in my 38 years covering the National Football League. And you say, well, what does that mean? And I say, He's everywhere at all times. He just shows up. I remember one time I am working for Sports Illustrated and I'm on the sidelines of a playoff game against Dallas in the muck and mire of Candlestick Park. It had rained all week, horrible weather. And I went down late in the game to interview George Toma, who was, you know, the, 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 the sod god, the god of grass you know, the most famous groundskeeper in sports history. And I go down to talk to him and I'm talking to him and I look up and there's Michael Zagaris. He probably doesn't even remember <clears throat> taking a picture of me and George Toma on the sidelines. But but what I mean is that he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. And we're going to get into that a little bit. But Michael, I do want to start by just saying that about, uh, I don't know, a month or so ago, I live in a building in Brooklyn and I was walking my dog and I came in and the guy behind the desk says, uh, Mr. King, you have, you have a package. And I said, okay, I'll take it. And he hands me this thing that looks like kind of a pizza box. It's like really, really, uh, it's kind of big, big rectangular. And he hands it to me and I go, oh my God, what is this? It weighed about 40 pounds. And this is what it was. Okay. It was the Michael Zagaris tome, Field of Play, 60 Years of Photographs by Michael Zagaris. And so I went in there and I had to start looking and start diving into it. And, and just to let everybody know, Michael, this there are many books about the history of the NFL that are glorious and wonderful. This certainly is one of them. The inside uh, pictures you have of the 49ers and the Raiders having been inside those teams, particularly the Niners are unbelievable. But what I really love about this book is that it shows everything about football. It shows Steve Young laying on uh, a training table at Lambeau Field in the trainer's room at Lambeau Field before a football game uh, having an injection, uh, you know, basically injected into his ribs. It shows the same thing, Bill Romanowski getting injected in his shoulder. And, and, and you only get that if you are there. So anyway, that's a very long and drawn out introduction to tell people that if you can lift it, you should get this book, Field of Play, 60 Years of NFL Photography, by Michael Zagaris. But anyway, Michael, welcome. Hey, it's great to be here, Peter. And yet, you know, I actually do remember that day. And and you and and George, who's another person that was always everywhere for yeah. a long time, whether it was Super Bowls, playoff games, World Series, George was omnipresent. Yeah. Michael, I let's let's go way back to the beginning about because I think people would kind of wonder, you know, you're, here you are, you're still this vibrant guy, 
uh, I think you're in good health, right? Yeah, knock on yeah. wood. Yeah, I, yeah. And and you're still doing this, and yet you went and you took pictures of you know Vince Lombardi in the Packers glory days at Kizar Stadium in San Francisco. You've got great pictures of Paul Horning and Max McGee and the picture of George Hallis on the sidelines at Kizar Stadium in a blue suit with a blue fedora and a white handkerchief pocket square. He looks like a Fortune 500 CEO. And, and it's just, it goes so far back and it's so great. And I just wondered, tell me how you got your start. You know, I'd always taken pictures as a kid. I had a little camera and, and when I was seven, eight, nine, we used to do our own football cards, you know, pose. And then we'd have our, because every, in those days, that's 53, 54, 55. We all played tackle football as third, fourth, and fifth graders. We were all into baseball. We were into all of it. So I always had my camera. We lived about 10 blocks from College of Pacific in Stockton. My brother and I used to ride our bikes almost every day and go to every practice. And the 1956 College Pacific team, they sent 11 guys to the NFL. Wow. Their backup quarterback was a sophomore named Tom Flores. Their wow. sophomore, in those days, you, could, you couldn't play until you were a sophomore. They had Dick Bass. They had Farrell Funston. They had John Nisby. They had Gene Crone and Bill Striegel. I, I could go on and on, but we were at practice every day. You see one of the pictures. I've got Dick Bass posing. I've got that College of Pacific team I was talking about. Six guys on that offensive starting thing. They went into the NFL. So I, I'd always shot but I never thought I was going to be a photographer and that didn't really materialize until maybe three years after the Kennedy, you know, Robert Kennedy was assassinated because I was in law school at the time, but I was working for Bobby and I was at the ambassador. Explain how that happened. You, you were a student at George Washington, right? Student at George Washington. In Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C., playing football, playing baseball, working on the Hill. I had a job with Pierre Salinger. Pierre was eventually defeated by George Murphy. You know, he, he was appointed to the Senate after Claire Engel died in California. Pierre's defeated. He goes to Paris, comes back about eight months later, calls me up, said, what are you doing now? I said, I'm carrying 17 and a half units. I was a, you know, Sino-Soviet major. I'm playing sports. He said, How'd you like to work on the Hill again? I said, for who? He said, I can get you a job with Senator Kennedy, probably, you know, doing a lot of the things you were doing for me, which was basically a glorified intern. Yeah. So it turned out I started working for Bobby Kennedy. I was doing everything from clips to running errands to doing research on speeches. That ends. I start law school at Santa Clara. Um, so I, and I knew that first month in law school this wasn't this is was nothing nothing that i thought it was going to be like it wasn't for me i'll finish out the year and see where i go that february mccarthy wins in new hampshire bobby decides to run for the presidency i go back to work for him part-time going up and down the valley going to oregon i end up the night in california the not ambassador knowing, hotel ambassador hotel you know kind of followed people and i'm i'm on the podium in the back and I'm thinking, okay, we're going to go up after this speech. We're going to go up there. We had, I think, a six or seven suites. There'll be parties. Somebody said, as I got on the podium, you know, I think we're going to be going to some buses. The senator's got one more speech he's going to make. I didn't know. We leave the podium. It's low ceiling. It's packed. I remember I was soaking wet because sweating. And I started it back following the crowd into the kitchen and it, all of a sudden, as I got to the door, it sounded like somebody let out a string of firecrackers. And my friend Bill Epridge was behind me. He was shooting for time and life. He knocked me into the door while running past me yelling nine millimeter. And my first thought was, oh, that's like a fisheye lens. I didn't even equate nine millimeter with a gun. And I got about 10 more steps, slipped, and almost so I thought it was on cooking oil. It was blood, and it turned out to be Paul Schrade. I remember seeing Rosie Greer, you know, about 
15, 20 yards ahead. He had somebody, people were yelling, screaming. It was pandemonium. Wow. We all know what happened then. I had to fly back the next day from LAX to SFO and then drive to Santa Clara where I had a contracts final in law school. I remember they handed the, the test out. I had eight blue books. I was numb because I found out when the plane landed that Bobby had died. So I sat there for about 15 minutes and then I, I remembered in my wallet, I kept these little squares. I had Roberto Clemente, Juan Marichal. So I took the square, one of the squares out, it was Marichal. I put it on the blue book. I took a quarter and I, you know, you transferred it. I drew a little balloon, Marichal's mouth. And I went, Mike, this is all bullshit. And I proceeded to fill eight blue books with how America was up and killed its leaders. That was the end of law school. My parents freaked. My dad said, what are you going to do now, big shot? And I said, I don't know, but I'll know when I see it. So and then how how did you get from there back to the 49ers? You know, I'd done rock and roll for a while, and I and I missed shooting and, and really hanging out in the locker room. I mean, when you quit playing, you don't miss practice so much, even games. You miss the camaraderie. I wanted to do that, of course. You, sorry, you can't work unless you have, you know, you're working for somebody. We can't give you a job unless you have experience. So I got an old football digest magazine. I remember Michael Herbert was the editor. I called, this is 1973. I called George McFadden, who was the PR guy, as Michael Herbert. Yes, George Michael Herbert, football digest. And uh, we've got this great young photographer, Michael Zagaris. And make a long story short, George leaves a round trip plane ticket for me at United Airlines in San Francisco to fly to Santa Barbara where the Niners are doing their training camp. I, I stayed in the dorm for a couple of days. That was my entree. From that, they gave me a season credential and I started each game I'd shoot. I would just go into the offices. They had an office in Redwood city. They had one here in, in San Francisco. I give them 15 or 20 pictures and they started buying them. $25 a shot. And I thought, wow, I'm I'm in the big time now. Yeah. They didn't really have a photographer. They had Frank Rippon, who excellent photographer, but he was an executive at Standard Oil that shot all their games. And they started using my stuff all the time. And then when the Morbido sisters sold the team to Eddie, I think the third week. Every, you know, they cleaned house. They had a new PR guy named Dave Fry. I went in to see Dave Fry, introduced myself. I said, Michael Zagaris, I'm the team photographer. And he goes, you know, I've got pink slips from all the people saying that they're the team photographer. And I said, maybe you should answer those. And he goes, you know, we really don't have the time to do that right now. He said, what's your deal with the team? I said, well, I shoot every game home and away. I sh they pay for all my film and processing. And um, I make 350 a week for games none of which was true and he said <laughs> wow well i don't know about giving you a raise right now can we just keep it at this and i said okay george about 10 years later mr d you know, we always had when we were on the road we'd have a hospitality suite we'd come to the east on a friday and the suite was open 24 hours until midnight saturday night you could go in there they had Anything you wanted to drink, they had hors d'oeuvres. So I come in there one night about 3 a.m. from wherever I was in whatever city I was and run into Mr. D, who had been doing the same thing, and he wanted it. It's Mikey, Mikey, how long have you been doing this? So we're talking, and I, I tell him this story. I'll never forget. He, he's looked at me, and he goes, you mother, you mother. Imagine telling that story to most any other team owner, you'd be summarily marched out and you yeah, know, probably taking yeah. a Greyhound Eddie, bus. Eddie would, Eddie would find great admiration for you in that, wouldn't he? Yeah. Oh, he, he thought this is great. This is a great story. Okay. So listen, listen. There's a few stories I want to ask you about from this book, but one of them is in 1978, before the Niners were really the Niners, there's a general manager on the team named J Joe Thomas who evidently was not very good at paying his bills all the time. So anyway, one day you are um, 
evidently about to get evicted and you haven't been paid in a while and you go to see Joe Thomas. Tell me what happened that day. Well, we hadn't been paid. My partner, Dennis Dupois and I, we hadn't been paid in eight weeks. I, I, my landlord was cool. He was about to be evicted. So we went down in those days. I think we had 52 people in the, the entire organization. So in one of the ladies in finance, she drew up the two checks of the money we were owed. I put them on a clipboard. I had the pen. The only thing we needed was Joe's signature. So I went up, knocked on the door, nothing. Knocked on the door again, nothing. Knocked on the door a third time, still nothing, but I knew he was in there. So I thought, open the door. He looks up from his desk and I walked in. I said, uh, coach, I know you're really busy. And I said, I don't want to bother you, but I said, you know, my partner and I haven't been paid in eight weeks and um, his landlord's ready to evict him. And Joe goes, what? Is that what this is all about? Money? Get the hell out of here. I'm like, now. So I, I walk out. I remember I go downstairs. Dennis is at the bottom of the stairs and he looks like he's going to cry. And he said, I'm, I'm done. I said, you know what, Kim? Team was out on the practice field. I went and sat at, um, I think it was George McFadden's desk. I'm looking around the desk. I opened a couple drawers. I found an old press release, maybe grab with Joe's signature on the bottom. There was a legal pad there. So I started doing Joe Thomas, Joe Thomas, Joe Thomas, Joe Thomas. Dennis goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to sign these checks. He said, you can't do that. That's forgery. I said, you want to be evicted? I'm signing mine. So I signed both checks and they cleared, you know, the rest is history. I love that. I kind of <laughs> like that. Michael, um, I want to get into three stories now. The first is, and your and your photographs for each one. The first is from the catch. You know, Joe Montana to Dwight Clark, uh, January 10, 1982. What really blew me away is that there's a photograph in this book of Joe Montana after the game lying in some room on the floor, exhausted, just spent. He has nothing left. And he's quite literally, he can't get up. And you found him in there. I want you to tell me the story. And, and look, at times you have to be thinking to yourself, you know, I bet Joe really wouldn't want me to be taking his picture right now, but you did. So tell me that story. We, you know, we had come in, I mean, it was kind of like pandemonium. We were, everybody was going crazy. We come down that long to, you know, go through the dugout, come through the tunnel, out into the locker room. Guys are jumping up and down, hugging each other. And I see Joe in that, on the other side of the room, under the sink with Chico kneeling there. So I, I just ran over and it's, it was all stream of consciousness and Chico was like attending to him. But so can I, I ask you, you say he was under a sink. Is that in the locker room, in a trainer's room? Where, where exactly? That was in the locker room. And you remember how candlestick you'd walk in. It was a and dump. Was, yeah. And, and the, you had the locker room below and then you went up those like yeah. seven stairs and you had the offensive linemen. And well, he was on the bottom there. When you first come in those doors, he, that's there was kind of a, a mirror and a sink. He was right there, under there. That's and so he was in plain sight. And when I first went up, I was just I was shooting, not knowing what was going on. And what had happened is he had come in and he was hyperventilating and he was having a hard time breathing. It's just laying down. And that's Chico was saying, Part, part, are you okay? And it was one of those things where you don't even think you're reacting. Yeah. And, and that's a lot of my pictures. I mean, I'm, you know, I try to approach it the way I approach life where you walk through life 180, letting everything wash through and over you. And you try to record, you know, most of the things that you think are pertinent. And after that game, that really, that kind of started 
the greatness, I, you know, I always thought that kind of started the greatness of that, of that franchise in so many ways, but you, you were there for some moments that were not altogether great either. There was a moment after a New York Giants game in New Jersey where Montana got the crap beat out of him, I think by Jim Burt, later his teammate. And you got a shot in the locker room after that game. Describe that scene and tell me about the shot. Well, there are a couple. There are a couple of different ones of Joe. There is one, the Jim Burt game, where yeah. Jim, I mean, he was knocked out and they took him off the field. The game was still going on. In fact, it was midway through the second quarter, as I recall. Dwight actually went up into the locker room, and I did too. And Joe is lying there out, but his eyes are open. He's out cold. And it was almost like, do we call a doctor or do we call a priest? And he yeah. spent, he ended up spending the, the night in the hospital. And, um, I mean, you know, we were knocked out of the game, so the season was over. There's another shot I have of him where he's got ice all over him and the, i mean the giants the falcons there are a number of teams they used to come and they'd bring it and they'd beat the hell out of him and you could do that back in those days and he was he had all kinds of bruises on him yet another one was roger craig he he used to have welts and blood blisters and i mean the, the league was a different league in those days and and you know to me my whole thing with this book, I wanted to show the real game from the point of view of a player or and or a coach. And I wasn't trying to be sensational or no. exploitive. This is this is what really happens. And this is the sacrifice. Steve Young this. gets shot in the ribs with a painkiller. Bill Romanowski yeah. gets shot in the shoulder. Joe Montana gets concussed. Yeah. And you've got the glory shots. You've got right. the celebrations. You have all the wonderful shots. And But you have the real. You know, there's one other real one, Michael. And that is you were on a team bus in 1990 uh, when, the, when the Niners are, I think, in New Orleans at the Super Bowl, right? Right. We're on our way to New Orleans. Sure. Yeah. You were, you were on a team bus. And you've got a picture, if you can imagine, a huge circle of football players with uh, three or four guys in the middle of them on the bus with one of those little pull-down desks on the back of a chair. And there's some cards, there's some money there. You see Montana, you see Ronnie Lott, you see Jim Burt, you see, you see, a, you see Eddie DeBartolo, I think. You see his head there and and i just thought that is really that's real that and look i haven't been there you've been there but right. what do you remember about that shot we were actually on the plane flying to new orleans for the okay Super Bowl, and they were playing tonk which they played every game and seifert's the coach and george hated that he said i don't want any gambling for money because people can lose and that can you know that can tear a team up and so they, we'd always have a lookout. And if George was coming, they'd go, coach. And they'd pick up the money and they'd throw down matchsticks. Well, that that game, as I recall, I think there was a $19,000 pot. So it was serious as a heart attack. And again, I wanted to, you know, the camera is merely a mirror that's freezing moments in time. And this is part of what was going on. And I remember something similar that I didn't put in the book, the strike year. Yeah. The, the second strike when we started bringing and a few teams, some of the, the veterans started coming back. I think the last game of the strike, I want to say Atlanta, but I'm not positive. But we had, by that time, we had about 15 veterans that had come back. So now they, they have me come to the back of the play and they said, Z, you've got to get a team picture. And everybody in the, in the picture is holding up, you know, $100, lots of $100 bills. So I take the picture. About 30 minutes later, I'm called up to first class. John McVeigh. John goes, uh, I understand you, you took a picture. I said, coach, I'm taking pictures all the time. He said, 
you know what I'm talking about. There's a picture of people holding lots of money. I said, coach, I'm not sure. And he said, stop. If I ever see that picture anywhere, he said, you'll no longer be employed here. I said, of course, coach. When John retired, we did a little, for the going away party, a little scrapbook for him. That was the last picture. <laughs> and at that point, he laughed. Oh, God. Poor John McVeigh. We, as we record this, John McVeigh has just died. And man, what a legacy he left. 91. Um, what a life. Yeah, really. What a life he's had. And what a life he, what a, a legacy he's left um, down to his grandson. You know, Sean McVeigh really is his grandfather's grandson in yeah, so many he? ways. You know, he really <laughs> is. I'm going to ask you about a picture that is one of my five favorite pictures in the book. And you'll be very surprised when I say it, because I'm sure that you think, oh, that was cool, but it wasn't great. You have a picture. I forget what year it was, um, but there's a picture of from left to right, Joe Montana, Steve Young, and a very youthful looking Mike Holmgren studying a play sheet apparently before a game and i just said first of all montana is not exactly the grizzled veteran but he's a you know he looks like a veteran steve young looks like he's 13 years old and mike holmgren looks like he's 25 and and you know he's uh, he's almost slim you know and i looked at that and i said that's utterly, utterly perfect. I want you to tell me the story of that photo. Well, that, sto that photo, that could have been any game, either pregame or halftime. And those guys were constantly studying. And, and Mike, Mike, more than a quarterback coach, then he was, he was a mentor. You know, he was, I remember him at Lincoln High School in San Francisco, then he went to USC. But I mean, he was great for, refining mechanics and he was with those guys all the time you know and at that point in time steve was the backup but a reluctant backup yeah and one of the one of the tension points then was steve's the nicest guy in the world yeah but he was the story i was hearing from a number of different people he was always upstairs like hey why am i not playing and joe one of the most competitive people in the world, he was aware of it too. And he could also feel Steve's hot breath on his neck. And this is a guy who had come from a situation first in high school in Monongahela, then at Notre Dame. This has been the story of his life. And so they were really not so friendly rivals. Steve yeah. was always cool with Joe, Joe not so much with Steve. Yeah. And that picture encompasses all of that. If you can really, if you know the story, it really just, it's almost like a hologram. You know, honestly, I've always thought of this, Michael, and you lived it. I didn't live it. I was very much on the periphery three times a year when I would just sort of helicopter in. But I always thought this. I always said, hey, Joe, Steve Young didn't trade himself to the San Francisco 49ers, you know, and obviously Joe was ticked off at, at Bill Walsh for a long time about it, but oh, yeah. you know, what, what do you expect young to do? Just sit there and say, yep, I'll watch my career go down the toilet. Now I'm not going to fight for myself. So exactly. Anyway, well, yeah. and with, and with Joe, this had been the story of his life. Yeah, well, exactly. What Bill did, Dan Devine had done. Yeah. His high school coach had done. Yeah. Michael, we're going to end with this because I think a lot of people will think, okay, you know, Vince Lombardi, George Hallis way back in the 60s. And and then a lot of the stuff that happened in the 70s and you got the Raiders in there and, and all that. But okay, what, what about today? There is a fantastic photograph after the NFC Championship game in 2013 of Colin Kaepernick basically congratulating Navarro Bowman after that game in the locker room. And, and so like, 
you really span the eras. It just, it doesn't end, you know, at the end of Montana Young Walsh. You know, you keep going and going and going. And so I want to ask you two things about that. What about Colin Kaepernick and what was he like to photograph and what sort of, if any, relationship did you have? You know, I could go on for an hour about that. I mean, very Colin was very misunderstood. I thought he was a very good quarterback for for a short period of time. People forget that by 2016, when he was kneeling, the team had was starting to fall apart and yeah, starting to grow. Yeah. He wasn't as good. Um, he was he was always his own person. I don't want to say he was shy, but he did his own thing. You know, at the end, a lot of the players on the team were pissed off because he'd always have the headphones on. He wasn't really interacting with people. Um, when he started kneeling down, I've got a double truck in the book of the actual first time he did it. Yeah. We're in San Diego, preseason game. There is a a Navy SEAL standing yeah. right next to him that had actually talked to Colin before the game. And it said, you know, you sat the last game. If you want to make a statement, you know, you might want to kneel. And I wasn't privy to the whole conversation, but once that started and, and we're, this is an election year, a firestorm. I can't, um, I can't remember how many lengthy press conferences he gave explaining his stand and why he was doing it yeah. articulated it very well the people that didn't want to hear it didn't hear it right and right. i'll never forget we played the bills in buffalo a week before the election and everywhere we went i stayed with him after we'd come back from pregame and we'd come out through the tunnel together i mean i had a at that point in time i thought this is this is a historic moment in our country's history, not unlike what Jackie Robinson did in 1947, albeit different, but, but mm -hmm. that's in very similar. We come up, came out of the tunnel. People were yelling things that I thought this must have been like 1947 in many ways, and in some ways worse. And I remember looking up and just the faces and the emotion and the hatred. And I remember staring at one, one of the people and one of our coaches pulled me and he said, he said, just keep going Z. He said, look around, man. We're in Buffalo. There's 60,000 of these mother. And he said, if they come out of the stands, he said, you're my dog. But he says, I'm, I'm booking. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was really once again, another moment in time that really transcended the sport. And, and I also feel football for the last 35, 40 years, really probably since the sudden death game, Colts and Giants in 1958, that became the national sport replacing baseball. And baseball was really defined who we were as a country for a hundred years, you know, much more pastoral and slow football now football. defines who we are as a nation, as a people in much the same way, the bullfight defined Spain for three or 400 years yeah. with the, the speed, with the pageantry, with the violence. And it's still, I mean, if you look on you know, television ratings, there's football and then there's everything else. Michael, how old are you? 77. I'll be 78 in February. How do you feel right now? Do you still feel pretty normal, pretty like you always have? You know, I'm for the most part, yeah. Um, I remember the last week of January in Green Bay. That was the first time, you know, by the middle of the third quarter, the cold wears on you. Yeah. And it started to get to me. I got that great picture in the back of the book where Hufanga's coming in with, ordinarily yeah. I would have been lying on my stomach to get a possible block punt. It was so cold by then, if I was lying on my stomach, 
I'd still be trying to get up. So I was on a knee. But I mean, I still I'm I'm very fortunate. I think genetically, I, I'm in good health. And I think the fact that I'm out there all the time in both baseball and football, constantly moving and being with people in their 20s, that's helped me. And you, you, you know, you've got to be in pretty good shape. Although I, you know what, I look at them and I feel like I'm anything but in good shape. But my wife reminds me, these are gladiators. They're yeah. 25. You're 77. You know, get a clue. <laughs> Michael Zagaris, the book is called Field of Play, 60 Years of NFL Photography. It's been a real pleasure knowing you over the years, and it's been great to have you on the show today. Thank you. Peter, it's always good seeing you, man. Next time you come to town, we're going to have to have dinner. So my thanks to Michael Zagaris. Great discussion, interesting discussion. And I learned so much from talking to him. Uh, you, I'm really glad you were able to hear some of his stuff, particularly about those great 49ers teams. Um, okay, segment two. I want to start on the left coast. And I want, I, I think there's interesting stuff about both Los Angeles franchises. And Miles has a very good opinion, I believe, about Baker Mayfield going into next year. And it's an opinion that I happen to share. Uh, and it has to do with sort of the depth at the quarterback position and also what we're seeing lately in Baker Mayfield. Miles, take it away. Well, I just think that whatever happens in these last two weeks, Baker Mayfield and the Los Angeles Rams have to find a way to continue the partnership between these two um, yeah. entities for 2023 and perhaps beyond that. And, and it's because Baker Mayfield looks extremely comfortable running Sean McVay's offense and Sean McVay looks comfortable calling plays for him. And I mean, uh, throughout this tenure now that he's had, and it's been a few games, I mean, you go back to that Thursday night game. How does that happen unless there is just some inherent comfort level that comes from being with Sean McVay, right? For Baker Mayfield. How do you, how are you able to go and do what you did against the Las Vegas Raiders? I don't know, but then over the last couple of weeks, we saw some good things in Green Bay. Mm, yeah, that's one game where it was cold. There were a lot of circumstances. I mean, for a lot of it, you still don't really know the names of guys who are playing for the Los Angeles Rams. But then you come home on Christmas Day, you have another week of practice, and you just could feel the chemistry building even more between Baker Mayfield and some of those yeah. dudes that were there on the field. I mean, Tyler Higby, what he was able to do with Baker Mayfield, to me, was extremely impressive. Right, Cam Akers running the football. That's obviously something that's been on and off for them all year. And there's been some weird stuff. But, hey, if you can run the football and then you can get play action and you can get all these different things, that's the way the Sean McVay offense is supposed to operate. And so when you have a quarterback who you know can run the offense and may not be able to be a starter in every single place, but he fits you. That to me means that that guy should still be in your building. I mean, Matthew Stafford has made it clear he has no plans to retire, and I think that's great. And he obviously should be the starter in 2023 for the Los Angeles Rams, let me make it clear. But backup quarterback is a very important position. And when you look at what John Wolford put on the field, what Bryce Perkins put on the field, those two guys are just simply not the caliber of quarterback that you have with a Baker Mayfield. Look at what the Eagles are doing, right? They know that behind Jalen Hurts, they have somebody that can keep them competitive with Gardner yeah. Minshew. I think it should be the same with the Los Angeles Rams. Find a way to keep Baker Mayfield around. And then who knows whether Matthew Stafford retires in another year, two years, whatever it happens to be. Maybe Baker Mayfield is your next Geno Smith and he's able to slide right on in there and you keep that continuity and you have somebody who can operate the offense at a high level and keep you winning games as you expect when you've got a Sean McVay coach team. Yeah, I love that. And I said that after his first game that uh, the one thing that the Rams should try desperately to do is to hope that nobody out there wants to give Baker Mayfield a significant multi-year contract yeah. after the season. And, you know, Miles, I would make one point about Baker Mayfield. And look, I think Baker Mayfield is going to have to ask Sean McVay a very serious question, which is, are you coming back next year? And <clears throat> how long will you be here? And if you leave, who's going to be 
uh, maybe not the head coach, but who's coaching me because I think Raheem Morris uh, is the likely heir to Sean McVay's well-loved in that organization. Uh, and they think he deserves a second chance at being a head coach. But the question is, <clears throat> who's going to coach uh, the quarterbacks? Who's going to coach the offense? Might it be Zach Robinson? I, you know, I don't think anybody knows the answer to that. And I think that's a huge part of the equation. But if I am Baker Mayfield and I can be around, if Sean McVay tells me I'm going to be back in 2023, Baker Mayfield should say, okay, I'm going to stay and I'm going to totally finish the rehab of my career, which had dive bombed. And, but I need to know if you're staying. And if he is staying, I categorically agree with you. Yeah. Miles, um, I want to ask you about the Chargers. And they've now are in their first playoff berth in four years. Uh, we all remember that when they were a young, promising team, Anthony Lynn, head coach, uh, Derwin James setting the world on fire in that secondary. This was <clears throat> this was a really, really good growing team. OK, and then the bottom kind of fell out, uh, which allowed them really to go get Justin Herbert. So they're able to rebuild sort of on the fly but what do you think of this team right now and what do you think of their ability to win a playoff game against what is likely going to be a significantly better team and and likely you've got to go to Cincinnati Kansas City or Buffalo yeah, I, I think that they're a good team and they're not a great team. I, I think that they're kind of growing into themselves, but I've I've not been totally like in clearly just big on impressed by what they've done in any game over the last few weeks. I mean, if they beat Miami and I guess that was their best defensive performance, right? When you talk about, you know, limiting yeah. explosives and things like that, that they did against that Miami Dolphins offense. Um, but at the same time, offensively, that game, not everything was kind of rolling for them. I mean, the biggest thing is, to me, they don't run the football very well. And when you have somebody like Justin Herbert, yeah, you you want to give him those opportunities to throw the ball down the field. And frankly, I was more pleased than I've been watching the Chargers offense in a while because in that game that they had on Monday night because they were throwing the ball toward the sticks and past the sticks and you get Mike Williams going down the field and Keenan Allen's making intermediate catches and I'm like oh my gosh this is so much better than watching Austin Eckler catch a pass out of behind the line of scrimmage and try to run it for a first down every single time so that I think shows a little bit of progress and if they get Joey Bosa back and he's healthy and he's doing what he can do at his highest potential that is going to be very tough for any offensive line to stop, especially when he's going, you know, he's got Khalil Mack on the other side of him. That's great. Derwin James got to be a smarter player. You know, you can't just go up and blow somebody up like that and end up in the concussion yeah. protocol yourself. Yeah. So that's one thing that they've got to do. But I, I, I do, I think they're good, but I don't think they're great. And, you know, I think their best bet probably is to go up against Kansas City because they, they know, know that so team. Well. Exactly. Yeah. You know, they know that they can go to Kansas City and be competitive. There's an argument that they should have won in week two on Thursday night football, if not for uh, what was a bad route by Gerald Everett that ends up being a pick six by Justin Herbert. So I I think they, they should feel good about themselves going into the postseason, but I don't know that I consider them a serious threat unless they're in Kansas City, they keep it close, and then Justin Herbert can do Justin Herbert things if, you know, there's two minutes or fewer to go. All right, Miles, we're going to enter a lightning round right now. I have just determined that because I don't want the podcast to be three hours long, okay. that we are going to go into a lightning round for our last four topics of the week. Are you ready to go? Let's go. All right. So <clears throat> the light the definition of lightning round, 60 seconds per topic. I'll start. Miles will finish. We're going to start on Tua Tongavaloa. Tua's fate after being declared back in the concussion protocol once again, it appeared as though in the game on uh, Sunday against the Green Bay Packers, 
his head snapped back, hit the turf um, right after he released uh, a pass in the third quarter. And to me, uh, if that's what it was and it looked like it is what caused him to be back in it, I think the only way he should play again is if um, a top neurologist can tell the Dolphins and tell him, I think you are absolutely perfectly fine again. Um, independent, independent yeah. neurologist. Yes. Your thoughts? I, I agree with you. It, it needs to be a decision that is made by a top neurologist and somebody that really, truly examines him. And I think everybody has good intentions when we go on Twitter and we say, oh my gosh, this looks terrible. This looks bad, man. So this is what Tua Tonga Vailoa should do. But maybe it's because my mother's a doctor and you know, you go through four years of medical school and then four years of residency and you have to get continuous medical certification. I just trust what they say more than what we say. So I, I don't want Tonga Vailoa to play unless he's going to be healthy, but that is a decision that's got to be made by a neurologist and not just people who make observations. Monday night, Buffalo on a six-game winning streak at Cincinnati on a seven-game winning streak. I talked to Zach Taylor, coach of the Bengals, after their game in New England, and he said, I mean, we keep winning. We've won seven in a row. And we have to keep winning uh, in order to win this division and beat Baltimore because Baltimore doesn't lose. And I think in this particular game, I, I'm going to I'm going to cop out slightly and I'm going to say, you tell me which quarterback doesn't turn it over and uh, which quarterback uh, wins the time of possession battle, which offense. That's the team that's going to win. Pick it, Miles. I think it's Cincinnati and I think it's Cincinnati because they're at home. And I, the thing that Zach Taylor says that I really love is they've got to come play us. Right. I mean, it's the same thing that they talked about with Kansas city. They figured out a formula to be able to beat that team. I think that they can do something similar against Buffalo, the way they play, you know, they play with the tenacity. They play with the fire. I, I love the way Cincinnati's been doing it. And, you know, I know that they almost gave things up against New England, but I, I feel good about Cincinnati winning this game. Dak Prescott, how does he stand right now in trying to get Dallas deep into the playoffs? Had a conversation with him um, after their game on Christmas Eve. I loved what he said to me when I said to him, Man, down uh, 10 points first half, down point, 10 points second half, two consecutive possessions with pick sixes last week in Jacksonville. First possession here gets you off. You're in a 10 nothing hole. What are you thinking? And he goes, I'm going to read this to you. I'm thinking about the way I was raised. Being the little brother, there's a lot of times I got my ass kicked. Things didn't go my way. The only time, the only chance I had was to forget about what happened, come back, respond. Sometimes I'd find my mother, I'd be crying and she'd say, if you can't play with the big dog, stay on the porch. And he told me, he said, that really is kind of ruled how I've approached the sport of football. As long as there's time on the clock and I have the ball in my hands, I think I'm going to win. And if I'm a Cowboys player and I've been a little bit iffy on Dak uh, this year, I love to hear him say that. Oh, yeah. I mean, you've you've got to love the attitude that Dak Prescott brings to the game and that he brings to that team. And you know what? T.Y. Hilton, who would have thought that that yeah. guy would be the hero on third and 115, right? I mean, who knew? I mean, all that talk about Odell Beckham Jr. possibly coming there, they end up getting T.Y. Hilton, and he can contribute right away, and so he does. So, I mean – well, the, the Cowboys can make a run in January. I, I think if there's a team that can go on the road and, and win, I think it's them. They bring their defense. They bring a good quarterback in Dak Prescott. They bring talented running backs. They bring talented receivers. I think they can make some noise in January. New Year's night. Baltimore and Pittsburgh again play. And it doesn't sound like there's a lot of optimism about the availability of Lamar Jackson. We'll see. But a little bit of history. Lamar Jackson uh, injured his knee on December 4, uh, sprained his PCL. And 
it's usually about a three week recovery time. So you would think he'd be getting close, but John Harbaugh this week was very, very uh, close to the vest, tight lip about uh, the future, the near future of Lamar Jackson. So I don't know that they're going to have him in Pittsburgh. If they don't have him in Pittsburgh, the Steelers are going to beat the Ravens. And look, first of all, the Ravens, uh, you know, recently have been awful on offense and, uh, you know, in his three-game absence, uh, in Lamar Jackson's three-game absence, uh, they're last in red zone efficiency and 30th in points. So I just don't think they're going to beat the Pittsburgh Steelers without Lamar Jackson. It's tough to say that the Baltimore Ravens should just kind of concede the point, but they have clinched a playoff berth. You obviously want to be able to go into the postseason and have a home playoff game if you can have it. So they still want to win that game because you still are chasing Cincinnati and you want to get and you want to get a better record than them. But if Lamar Jackson's not healthy and you know that, then it kind of behooves you to make sure that he's healthy. And with the yeah. way that he uses his legs. You know, that, that three week or so PCL sprain recovery time, you might want him to get another week, maybe another couple so that, you know, he's at his best when you're going into the postseason. So I, I can yeah. certainly see the Steelers winning this game, too. Yeah. And, you know, and the other thing, the Steelers, look, I, I know this is corny and I don't really know anything about, you know, the carryover because that's a bit of a sports writing cliche, the old Franco Harris effect, you know, that allowed them to, to come back late and to, uh, and to obviously beat Vegas. But talking to Cam Hayward after that game, he was really, he it was one of the last people uh, outside his family to speak to Franco Harris, recorded him for his podcast just hours before his death. And he thinks the Franco factor is real, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. Hey, who knows what happens, but I'm sure Mike Tomlin will try to feed into that Steelers seven and eight, a lot better than I thought they'd be this year. Uh, they're an interesting team headed into the last two weeks of the season. Miles, that's it for us this week. Uh, we'll be back in our normal environs yes. uh, next week to record the podcast. I appreciate uh, you stretching yourself this week and while you're taking some time away from family time uh, to partner with me on the podcast, uh, my gratitude for that. And my gratitude to all our listeners and viewers, both on NBC Sports YouTube page and uh, wherever you get your pod podcast uh, to experience the Peter King podcast presented by Salesforce. We'll be back next week with another edition. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.